thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. So to, my name is Alon, and I'm going to speak about uh, passwords and how we can make those great again. So before I start, I'd like to introduce myself. So I started coding about 20 years ago. I studied at Ben Gurion University, and I worked for a couple of jobs just before I joined Dropbox about a year and a half ago. So I joined to a local site in Herzliya. We're about 30 developers. Uh, the, the local site in Herzliya was opened after Dropbox acquired a, co a local company called Cloudon. And we all work on the Dropbox for Business product, which is basically bringing all the good things that people like from the personal product to the business world and gather, in, uh, gather companies and teams around one collaborative tool. So a few weeks ago, we all celebrated 10 years to Dropbox, and hopefully we will have more events like this in the future. So probably the reason you came here is not to listen to me talking about myself, but about passwords. So without further ado, let's continue. So I put here two passwords. I'd like you to take a few seconds and think to yourself which password is better, or maybe you can make a vote. So also I, make, I made a demonstration about how, you, how I see it, but of course you can use your imagination. So who thinks that the first password is better? Who thinks that the second password is better? Okay, it's like 50-50. <laughs> so what I consider myself as a good de developer, and so what a good developer does when he has a question that he don't, doesn't have the answer for, so he goes to Google. So I went to Google and asked Google, hey Google, what's considered to be a good password? And also you can try it yourself after this talk if you have iPad or iPhone, maybe, hey Siri, it's probably better. So you can see here the answer. So Google, Google says that in order to have a good password, you need to apply to four rules. It has to, it has to have six characters or more. It has to include mixed cases, upper and lower. It has to include numbers, and it has to include special characters. So again, I went like a good developer. I went and I drew a table with my password and the four rules. And I try to see which of the password matches more rules. So both of them have six characters or more. Only one of them has different cases. Only one of them has numbers. And only one of them has numbers, has the special characters. So I could call the winner, of course, easily. Yeah, this is true. So I could now move on with my life after I answered this question. But just before I fell asleep, I remember a story I really liked as a kid. It's called Alibaba. Well, it's not this Alibaba, of course. It's this one. So probably you all know the password from there. It's Open Sesame. It's like one of the most famous passwords in the world. So this password has no special characters, has no numbers, no upper and, ca and lower. It was even invented long before we could even think about computers. So if I could go back in time and ask this guy here, What's considered to be a good password? The answer I get is probably different than the one Google gave me. It's probably going to be like something more simpler. And, it's, and I guess it could be something like this. A good password only needs to apply to two rules. It has to be hard to guess, but then still easy to remember. And that's all. So what's hard to guess? So we can say that a password that is hard to, that is hard to guess is just the number of guesses required to find the password. So I don't know exactly how many guesses and hacker would need to crack my password, so I can use some estimations and some heuristic to get that. But this can grow up to thousands, millions, and billions. So let's just take, let's just define something I call the entropy. This is equals to the log in the base of two of this number. And we also can look in the entropy as the number of bit it takes to represent the password, which is also, of course, equal. Like the log of the number and the num number of bit it takes to represent it. So let's take a look at the probably most naive approach, which is brute force heuristic. So we can assume that this, this password is fully randomized, only randomized letter and numbers. So we can call, so we can say that the entropy equals to the length of the password multiplied by the log of the cardinality. So the cardinality is basically like the number of, of signs within a range. For example, if we have in English, in lowercase, we have 26 signs, 26 letters. So the log of that is when we round it up is five. And if we use lower and upper and numbers and special characters, the log of this cardinality would be seven. So for example, if we have 
six characters long password. So the entropy, so the entropy of the password, if we only use lowercase letters, is 30. Just multiply five by the length, which is 30. And then if we also include uppercase numbers and special characters, the entropy grow, grow up to 42. And what about the time to crack this password? So the first one is quite easy to crack, only 15 days in the rate of 1,000 guesses per second. And the other one is much harder, it's 140 years, which is probably, you won't, be, you won't live long enough to see this password crack. So we can sum, summarize this and say that if we want to maximize the entropy of this password, so we need to maximize either the length or the cardinality. So this is like the basis of the rules that we saw before. So if we want to maximize the length, it has to, be, it has to include six characters or more. And if we want to maximize the cardinality, we have to add also uppercase numbers and special characters. But unfortunately, we're humans, right? We're not robots. So it's really tough for us to create passwords all randomized with numbers and some special characters and all this stuff. And if we log in in average to 30 sites, we have 30 different passwords. And if we sometimes want to update our passwords, this makes it even harder. I don't know about you, but for me, it's impossible to remember like 10 passwords with all randomized letter and numbers. So what do we do as humans? We go into some patterns. For example, Troubadour ampersand 3. So let's take a look on this password and try to get a more realistic estimation of this password. So we can say that the Troubadour is just a word in English, right? It's not a common one, so we can find this in a, in a, in a dictionary with English words like a big one, two of the power of 16 words. And we also made some uh, modifications here. For example, we uppercase the T, so we can reserve one bit for that if it's lower upper. We also have three candidates for lit. So lit is just vis visual transformations for letters to numbers or special characters. For example, you turn the O into zero, we turn the, the A into four, and so on, we have something like 10 to 15 rules like this one. We also added a ampersand, which is also a common character. We can reserve four bits for that, three bits for a number, and one bit for the order between these signs. So when we sum it all up, we get the entropy number, which is in a more realistic approach, which is 28. So in the same rate of 1,000 guesses per second, this, in, this can be cracked in three days, which is actually makes this password really weak. What about this, the next one, the blue giraffe plays ball? So here we have four words. These are common words in English, so we can use a small dictionary, like one of the size of two of the power of 11. So we can reserve 11 bits for each word. And then when we sum this all up, we get the entropy, which is 44. In the same rate, this takes 550 years to crack, which is also probably a lot of time. And you won't live long enough, unfortunately, to see this one cracked. Too bad. So, let's take a look now which one is easier to remember after we saw which one is harder to guess. So, the first one is very easy to remember, of course. It was trombone question mark three, or maybe not, sorry. It was troubadour question mark three, but then I deleted some of the characters. I'm not sure which one was it. I also had this mark with this question mark, or exclamation mark, or... Oh. Really, who knows? Really? I went over the slides like 10 of times and still have no idea what was the original password. And what about the next one? So, yeah, blue giraffe plays ball, stays blue giraffe plays ball for good. So I'm not telling you now to go and like change all your password to this long password with multiple words, though this can be a good practice if you have like sites that you don't log in a lot and you still want them to be very secured, for example, your bank account. But maybe a good suggestion would be to go over your password and see that you don't use some very trivial modifications. For example, lit is a very, it's a good example for what you shouldn't do because it's really trivial to, like every cracker can crack this in a second. And it also makes, it's just confusing, confusing you. So let's take a look on another password. This one is password one, two, three, four, five, six, exclamation mark. So let's break this down. So we have here password, which is the first it's the first word in any cracked uh, dictionary password, so we can reserve non-bit for that because this is trivial. 
The second one is one, two, three, four, five, six, which is the second common password in any cracked up dictionary. So we can reserve one bit for that, write only a selection between two passwords. And then another common exclamation mark at the end, so we can reserve two bits for that. And we sum it all up and we get that the entropy for this one is three. You might say that we don't always know what pattern the user uses, so we can reserve some more bits for that. But even without all this breakdown into estimations, you can just look on this password and say that it really sucks. Right? And it can be cracked in seconds. So I went to the biggest site in the world, all this Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Apple. And I tried to see what would they say about the password. So what do you expect? Well, surprise. Google said that this password is, is really strong. As you can see, full bar, I think it was four out of four. So I thought, I thought maybe Google just made a mistake, but so I went to <laughs> Facebook and also a very dark green here with a strong, maybe Twitter. Ah. Twitter also gave me a full bar. I think it was 12 out of 12. Apple, I, I had to make a small modification, uppercase the P, and then I got that this password is really strong also, almost full bar. So what we would like is something like this site, which you can put your password and break it down. And if you can see here, maybe it's a little small, you can see the entropy estimate, which is three, and then the approximate time to crack is instant. And also if we can get this all break down into the pieces, like here, so password is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six is one, and exclamation mark is two, this could be great. So thankfully this is not a dream. This is a really a real site. You can go after this talk and put your passwords or passwords similar to yours and check how strong are they. But this is only this is really a simple site. It's just a UI wrapper to a bigger project called ZXCVBN. So what's ZXCVBN? It's a realistic password estimator. It was initiated at Dropbox in a hack week of 2012 by Dan Wheeler. So in Dropbox, we have two weeks every year that we can literally do anything that we want, from building cool open source like this, to make modifications on our product, to create you know, internal tools, create even like crazy things, like the biggest Nintendo NES controller in the world, which this is a real story. It was implemented in Python by Daniel Wolf. It's open source on GitHub, so we can go and see all the all the source now under MIT license, also means that you can do anything you want with that. It has, as you can see, tons of stars, contributors, and forks. The last Python release was in January 17th, so it means that this library is continuously updated. So, how it works, right? So, I'm, this is going to be like a tech part, probably about seven minutes, so if you don't like this, all these tech issues with a deep dive, you can just take a nap and I'll make sure to wake you up when it's over. So like every good thing in the world, this can be split to three parts, match, score, and search. So the first, uh, the first step is matching. So the first thing that we do, do here is just we take all the possible substring from the password. I just put here like a few, a few substrings, but there are many more. This is just an example, but we really, we literally break this into all possible, all possible strings. And then we try to match it with one of eight matchers. So what are the matchers? So the first matcher is dictionary. We try to match our password with the dictionary. So we have a few dictionaries like English, names, cracked passwords, TV, movies, and many more. You can also add your additional dictionaries like with the URL of your site, your site name, some maybe regional information, for example, passwords in Hebrew. And you can also add like the user context. When you call the functions, you can, you can, you can, when you call the function, you can also send some parameters about the user. For example, the user name, the user email, so on. So the next matcher is reverse. It tends to be that people use a lot of reverse we're taking a word in English and then, and then reversing it. So this is another matcher. Also, we have here is the lit matcher, like the one we saw before with the visual transformations. We have the special matcher, which is like 
query and ZXCVBN, so now you know where the, the name come from. It's like keystrokes that next to each other. So also some more complicated ones, as you can see here. Repeat is just repeating yourself, AAA, AAA, or 112211, and so on. Date is, of course, date, but we have like use reg regex to just find different patterns. Sequence like one, two, three, four, five, six, and also in reverse order like Z, Y, X, and everything that doesn't fall to any to any matcher like this one, you can call it a brute force. So let's take a look on another on our example. So we try to match each each one of these uh, substrings. So some of them, as you can see, match to the dictionaries like password one, two, three, four, five, six. Some match, some match to sequence, some match to both, of course. So now that we have all the matches, we can throw away the others, the one that we called brute force, and we can stay only with the, with, with the one that matches. So the next step is taking all these matches and try to score each one of them. So I put here, like, as you can see, a lot of formulas for each matcher. Some uses some combinatoric, some more like complex uh, formulas, but Let's just take a look. I don't think I have time to look on all this, so just take a look on the first one, probably the most common one, which is a dictionary. So the dictionary returns the, the try to fit a password, but also returns the rank in the password. So these dictionaries are sorted from the most common words to the uncommon words. So if we have like a, a word that is, is 16th in, the, in this order, so we can say that it takes 16 time to guess this password. So if we want the entropy, you can just take the log of that. So for our example, also add here is, as you can see inside the dictionaries, you also have their rank. For example, password is ranked first. So if you take a log of that, it's zero. So exa another example is one, two, three, four, five, six, which is rank two. So a log of that is one and so on. And we also take the minimal number because we're looking for the weakest link on our password. So after we scored all these uh, matches, we go to the third step, which is actually finding the password. With the, with the best build. So we have, as you can see, every password has like a lot of builds. You can build in many ways from the substrings. And then if we take the scores from the previous step and put it here, you can see that every build gives us an, a different uh, entropy if we sum it all up. So what, again, what we're really looking for is the build that gives the minimal score. So we can throw the rest and just look for this one. So how do we find this build? We can use some uh, recursion uh, approach, like taking every substring and deciding whether we want to put it in our set or not, and then continue with the uh, recursion. But this is really not effective, probably can, you, all, you all know. Well, if we want to run this on the client side, this can take a lot of time. So we can use something more efficient, which is dynamic programming. So we just draw a table, we put on the x-axis, we put the indexes, as you can see here, also I put the password, and we put on the y-axis all the, the matches. I also added here the index, the last index of the match, and also the score, so you can see it. And then we can fill this table up. Yeah, like a charm. So now that it's all filled up, so we can find in the bottom right corner, we can find the the minimal entropy, which is in our case is three. And if we also save some backward po pointers to what led us to there, we can also, we can just build a password in reverse order and then reverse it and we get the full password. As you can see here, password, then one, two, three, four, five, six, and then exclamation mark. So this is the end of the technical part. So you can now wake up if you took a nap. So you might expect that this takes like really complex and can take a lot of time but the reality shows some different numbers. So it's really, really fast. It's f approximately five to 20 milliseconds for up to 25 characters. It's very lightweight. The code is less than 50 kilobytes. Also, you can look at the GitHub. I think it has like something like thousand lines of code. The data is less than uh, one megabyte, which is basically dictionaries, of course. You can also cut this, like if we want to a lower data so you can cut some dictionaries on the middle. It's implemented in Python, of course, but also in many other languages like Java, Golang, and many, or probably any like common language you can think of. 
What about the usage? Also super simple. Install it by pip install ZX DVBN Python, and then import it, and just call the function with the password. And you got like a full detailed result. So how does the result look like? So as you can see here, you have uh, all details. So you have the first part is the, the crack time seconds in different rates. So we only talked about one rate, the thousand guesses per second, but you can talk about it online, online rates, online like with throttling and without throttling. So we have here like the calculation in different rates. You also get a feedback, like if your password is weak, why is it weak? And a suggestion how to improve it. You get here the guesses in the log in the base of 10. And then the sequence is the break up to the different substring and the scores. Score is just a score from zero to four. The password that you sent and the call time took the ZX CVBN to run for this password. So in this case, it took four milliseconds. So how do we use ZX CVBN at Dropbox? So in Dropbox, we have a strength meter, as you can see on the side, with like four bars. We don't require you to use any like strength. We don't uh, enforce anything. We just advise you to use a stronger password. The only requirement is six, pa is six characters. Each password needs to be six characters, that's all. But as I said in the beginning, we also have, in Israel, we work on what's called Dropbox for Business. So there we have teams or companies, and each team like this has an admin. So this admins want to protect their users by requiring, by requiring them to use a strong password. So this is how our competitors understood that. As you can see, like a lot of checkboxes require numbers and drop downs and like very complex configuration. But in Dropbox, we believe in a very simple UX and UI, also for the admins. So this is how it would look like in Dropbox. We only have two buttons, one to turn the feature on and off, and the other one is to set the password strength. Well, that's all. So this actually is not yet uh, on air. It's just an, we are developing this in Tel Aviv. And later on today, Dropbox is going to pre-announce this feature. So we also got a sneak peek into the future. Well, also for the user, it's super easy. He doesn't need like, to get a list of requirements. Does, he, all, he only got the, the number of bars you need to exit. And what are the problems? So the problem is first that when we started working on this project, we only had like the client side, the JavaScript, because we didn't need to enforce anything. So now when we wanted to enforce things, we had to also add the, the server side. And in Dropbox, we work on Python, so we added the Python component, and then we found out that in, with some different passwords, these two different libraries return different scores. And the feedback is all also, it's, it's kind of informative, but it can be sometimes confusing, like this one could be sometimes long, So that, that's it about uh, ZX VBN. So now we have like two minutes for fun part. So again, if you don't like fun parts, you can, the door is here. So how did I, probably you don't give a shit about passwords, you just want to know how did I drew this beautiful giraffe. So I used a tool called AutoDraw by Google. It's really cool. It uses machine learning to make this beautiful giraffe that I drew into a more beautiful giraffe. And if you, take, if you need to take one thing from this, this talk, probably this is it. It's a really, really cool, cool tool. You just can go after that talk and go into Google and just search for AutoDraw. It's really cool. And this is, as I promised, this is the biggest uh, Nintendo NES controller in the world. It was built in last uh, Hack Week at Dropbox. You can find this in, in our headquarters in San Francisco. So we can we also have some things here. So this is a disclaimer about this was super simplifying all this ZX VBN. If you really want to dig into the code, you have it all. You have a lot of blogs. I put it here, blogs, talks, like formal docs and all that. Create some credits. And that's all. So if you have any questions. It's just like the number of, I, I'm not sure. I don't have the, I don't remember the exact numbers of the entropy and the levels. But you can just, I can just take, take, a, take a look after this and check exactly if you want to know the exact entropy and like the mapping between the entropies and the level. Just like a number, of course, so it's the entropy and the level. 
Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't remember like the exact numbers, but you can just, again, you can just uh, install it and then check yourself, or you can come after this talk and we can check together. Ah, uh, <laughs> a better name for the for the library. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think it's like it's hard to tell to, to say every time ZXVBN, ZXV. <laughs> it's not easy though. So. Query is better, but <laughs> no, no, it doesn't go online at all. You have all your dictionaries. Yeah, it's completely local. You have all the dictionaries. I I, saw, I showed before. You have one megabyte of dictionaries. It's all local. This is another cool thing. You don't need to go all the time online. It's really easy to use and implement and integrate to your site. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do that, really. If you care about security, of course. Any other one? Well, if you're shy and you have more questions, just, I, I'm going to be like near the Dropbox booth, probably for an hour or a little more, and, or maybe walking around so you can ask me really anything. So thank you for coming. I hope you had fun.